Hello everybody, Judge April back for another top 10 list. This particular list, I think I did three different times. I was like, I haven't done this list. And so I like wrote out another top 10 list and I'm like, no, I haven't done the list again. So I wrote it out again. So I have three different versions of the same list and they're all completely different, which just goes to show how I have literally no idea what should be on this list at all. So bear with me when we go down this list. So again, today we're talking about the Vintage Cube, and the, today's list is the top 10 cards that go too late. So these are not necessarily cards that are super busted. These are not cards that you necessarily wanna take pick one or pick two or pick three. These are just cards that tend to go much later than I feel that they should go. So they might typically go like pick 11 when they should be pick six. So they might go pick four when they should be pick two. Um, and so on. So let's start out at number 10. This is a card, when, it, when I first saw that it was included, I was very skeptical about it. I, I didn't think it would be very good. You know, they, they've had a lot of cards similarly throughout Magic's history that have not been very good. But this one really turned out to be much better than I thought. And that is Coercive Portal. It just costs four mana. It's a four mana artifact and essentially it has a lot of text on it, but what the text really says is draw an extra card every turn. And I thought, well, you know, an extra card every turn for four mana, that's pretty good. But we already have things like Harmonize, which is two and two green that draw three cards. You know, Thirst for Knowledge that draw three cards, sort of minus one or minus two. You know, we have lots of cards that draw more cards. So I thought, well, this one's four. So I guess it's it's just so-so, it can't be that good. but. In a lot of attrition-y games, it's, 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 it's turned out to be like incredibly strong, especially because it often comes down on turn three. You know, you do a turn one land, turn two signet, and then you just do turn three coercive portal. And throughout the rest of the game, you just get to grind them out with sheer card advantage. It's 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 really, really good card. Um, I don't know if it's a card I would take, you know, my first five picks, but I'm often very happy to have it as a late pick in my deck. It's colorless and go in a lot of decks. It keeps you from flooding out. So of course, the portal coming in at number 10. Coming in at number nine are a, a pair of counter spells, one of which I think is slightly better than the other just because people never see it coming, and that is Mana Tithe and Force Spike. They're basically the same card. One is white and one is blue. They cost a single mana a piece, and they say a counter target spell unless this controller pays one mana. And Especially Mana Tithe, I have won so many matches with this card. I assume my opponents just like rage quit and throw their laptop across the room because you just don't see it coming. In the Vintage Cube, people want to just slam their best cards as soon as possible, especially against a deck that is, just has white mana open. They just completely tap out and you Mana Tithe them. You pay one mana to counter their Batter Skull or their Worm Coil Engine or their Sundering Titan or whatever it is you're countering. And you just you've just won the game because you just you just you're so far ahead on mana, you're so far ahead on tempo, you know, and they were often relying on that card to win the game. So mana tithe is better than force spike. Force spike is not quite as good because there's also spell pierce in the cube. Uh, I think that's the only other one mana blue counter spell, but people will often be like, well they have a blue open, so it's possible that they have force spike open, but people just never see mana tithe coming. So if you're slashing white or you're playing white as your main color, I really like having Mana Tithe in the deck. Coming in at number eight are basically the, the removal spells that are just very, very broad answers. Particularly, we're talking about cards like Dreadbore, which is one red and one black to kill a Planeswalker or a creature. Cards like Maelstrom Pulse, which blow up a non-land permanent. Cards like, which is one, a green and a black to blow up a permanent. Cards like Vindicate, one, a white and a black to blow up any permanent. These are, are the kind of answers that I really, really like to have in my deck. You know, in the Vintage Cube, you often go into a match and you don't know if whatever removal that you have in your deck is going to be blank. If you go up against a deck that is, for example, like a sneak attack deck, they only have like three creatures in their deck. Sometimes like your swords of postures are not that good because the card is already in play. Um, and it's done its effect as blown up four lands or they've drawn seven cards with Grizzle Brand. So these really broad answers that still kill a creature, but also, you know, if they, if they don't play a creature, can still blow up an artifact Manus Rock or blow up a, a busted enchantment are super strong. You know, they're all good against Storm, they're good against 
They're good against creature decks. They're good against basically every single deck. And, and that's why I like them. They're never blank cards. In the Vintage Cube, you really don't want to have blank cards because if you can't answer a threat because you have the wrong kind of answer, you will often just lose the game that way. Coming in at number seven is Through the Breach. This is a card that I think it goes late because people look at it and they say, well, this is just a one-time effect. I want a repeatable effect or a card that will be more consistent in my deck. But I really like Through the Breach. I mean, I often see it go pick eight or pick nine. And it goes in both the Sneak Attack deck as just a second Sneak Attack. But it also goes in, uh, it also goes in Reanimator. It goes in the Tinker decks. It goes in all of these decks. And being able to like cast or put a huge creature out at the end of their turn, like on their end step. So, you know, you, you might have, especially if you have like multiple of the same effects in your hand to cheat a creature into play, but you know they might have a counter magic. You know, you can do a through the breach at the, on their end step, then they might counter it, right? They, they, they have to counter it because, you know, you're gonna put in an Emrakul or an Ulamog or something, right? On their end step, and then you just have your turn and you just get to slam sneak attack. You know, it, it, it's both great for getting that card, these huge creatures which are dead in your hand, out of your hand, but they're also great, you know, because they can draw out counter spells. And like for, for like the reanimator deck, sometimes you just, you're just not getting that discard outlet that you need. And this is like the best discard outlet. So you just get to like put Grizzlebrine into play, attack for seven, draw seven cards, Grizzlebrine dies, and then the next turn, you just get to bring him back because he's now in your graveyard. So through the breach, uh, I think is, a, sneaking, a sneak effect, a cheating effect that people underrate be, just because you just get only one use out of it and it costs five mana, but I think, I think it's actually a, a much better card than it looks to be. Coming in at number six is a card that I never, ever would have thought was gonna be on this list. I completely rolled my eyes when I, when I saw it. I was like, this card is just, this is a fine standard card. It's a great standard card. Uh, it's in standard right now, it's, it's, it's great. You know, but that's all it's ever gonna be. And that is the Looter Scooter Smuggler's Copter. I've been really pleasantly surprised by this card, you know, especially in the aggressive decks, the mono white deck and the mono red deck, where it provides a threat that's actually often really hard for a lot of decks to answer. In the cube itself, there's just not, there's, I don't think there are, if there are, there's not very many of them, but there's very few cards with reach. And there's relatively few flyers outside of out of outside of white, uh, so you know just having a three three that gets to attack in the air every single turn while also making your hand better is just so good. You know, late in the game when you draw when you're playing mono red and you draw a jackal pup, but they have a three three in play, like they have some some dude in play that's just stalling out your ground attack. Just being able to go, you know. Jackal Pup, attack for three, and then you get to discard a mountain and hopefully draw like a burn spell. It's just really, really solid. Uh, it's, it's, it's hard to kill with a sweeper. It's, it's just been a really pleasant surprise for me. Um, in the aggressive decks, it's great. I like it a little bit less in the green deck, but uh, even there, sometimes that deck will flood out with too many mana dorks and, or too many mana dorks and land. And so like just being able to loot one of those away can be, can be good. It's just not at its strongest there, but in, like in the mono white and the mono red deck, I really like having it, especially if you have you know twelve or so creatures. Smuggler's Copter, take it, take it if you're if you're aggressive. Coming in at number five is what I think is by far, and I don't even think it's close actually, uh, the best sweeper in the cube. Aside from maybe balance, balance is a little cheaty. It's kind of a sweeper, but it's not really intended that way. Coming in at number five is Toxic Deluge. It's, it's, it's a sweeper, and I think people often let it go much later than you would think because it costs you life to, to do the, to do the uh, effect. But it's, it's really very, very strong for a couple reasons. One, it's very easy to splash. So if you are not a deck that is main white or main black, you have very few options for wiping the board. You have, like, you have wildfire effects in red, and that's about it. You have, you know, you have upheaval in blue, but these are very expensive. When you're facing off a deck against a deck that's aggressive, you want to be able to kill their creatures early. Toxic Deluge is both very easy to splash because it only costs a single black mana. It doesn't cost that much. Usually the decks you want sweepers against, you're spending two to four life, and that's 
usually about as much as the damage you were gonna take from this creature's attacking the next turn anyways. And plus, you know, it can be a one-sided sweeper. You know, if you have uh, a 6-6 six, six in play and they have a bunch of 2-2s two, and 3-3s th and 4-4s, four, you just get to wipe out their board and your creature gets to continue on living. So Toxic Deluge, I think, is uh, is is the sweeper that I, I take the most. It's always good. I almost never am unhappy with it. It also can kill indestructible things like Ulamog. You know, I've, I've, I, have be honest, I have won games where my opponent, you know, did a show and tell on Ulamog, and then I just did a Toxic Deluge for 11 and, and killed him. So, Toxic Deluge, number five, it's great. Coming in at number four is a card that I see go way, way, way too late in so many decks. Uh, it goes off in 12th pick, I see a 13th pick, and maybe it's just because white is not one of the stronger colors in the cube. And that is Caracas. This card is phenomenal. You know, I, I before I wrote down this list, I, I thought, why? Well, you know, it's I know it's good. I know there's a lot of legendary creatures in the cube, but how many are there that it, that it actually blanks? The creatures that don't have hexproof like Th Thrun or Geist of St. Traft? And it's about 30 creatures. So Caracas, just on its own, it's a land. You know, you get your white mana just as you would with the planes. Acts as just an, a removal spell again and again and again for 30 creatures in this cube. 30 creatures out of 540 cards, you we're talking, you know, 5% of the cube, I think. I just did the math in my head. Hopefully it's not wrong. But you know, but I think about 5% of the cube, it's a removal spell for, while secretly just, while just being a card that doesn't take up any cards, any extra slots in your deck. That's the thing, with, that's why I think this card is so good and should go much higher is that is in the vintage cube, you always have enough cards to play. You know, unless your draft went horribly awry, you're probably gonna have 27, 28, 29 playables in your deck. You know, unlike, you know, a normal draft where sometimes you might have like 24 playables, 23 playables, or even the legacy cube where there's just, nowadays there's just a lot of cards that are just not good anymore. In the Vintage Cube, you're gonna have more cards on average than you can fit in your deck that are still good for your deck. So a really unique effect like Caracas should go very highly because you can always get another, you know, Wrath of God, or you can always get another white creature that does something, but you could, there's only one Caracas, and there are just some decks that just cannot beat it. You know, if they're sneak attacking, well, sneak attack is, is pretty good against it, but you know, through the breaches and reanimation spells, they just, sometimes those decks, you know, they might just have Iona and Grizzlebrand and they cannot beat Caracas. They just can't. They'll, they just can't attack into you. Uh, and, and when it's just taking up a normal plane slot in your deck and costs you nothing else, that is exactly the card that makes a deck much better with zero cost of all. So number four is Caracas. If you're a white deck, I think you should be taking this card much earlier you know, then, then, uh, then it definitely goes that I, that I, that I see it go. Coming in at number three, I think is the best red four drop in the cube. You know, I thought when I was drafting mono red, because I've, I love drafting mono red in cubes that it's actually good. Uh, and you know, you can always get away with saying, Koth, Koth is the best red four drop. And you might not be wrong, Koth is always good. You know, if you're playing a red deck wins kind of deck, a burn deck in, in a cube, and you draft Koth, your deck is gonna be much better because of it. But this is a card that when I first saw it printed, I thought, no, eh, it's, it's gonna be okay. But especially in the vintage cube, it's outstanding, and that is Fiery Confluence. This card just closes out the game so quickly. You know, typically you don't want these kind of effects in your deck if you're a red deck. Uh, you, you don't want historically things like Lava Axe, which costs, I think, five in a red to just do five damage directly to the face. And this is often what this does, is just six damage to the face. But, it, and that's often, I think that's probably the way I've cast it the most often, is just two damage to the opponent, two damage to the opponent, two damage to the opponent, and they've just lost the game because they're at six life. But the fact that it can also blow up a bunch of mana rocks at the same time, you know, you can choose to do four damage to their face and blow up uh, a Thran Dynamo, you can blow up two Signets and do two damage to their face. You know, sometimes, you know, I cast it, like you play against a deck that has a bunch of 
one toughness creatures like a, like a green deck and you do four damage to their face and you kill all their mana elves. This card is just always outstanding. You know, it always wins, like it, in a game like, where the red deck will off, often stall at the end, where your opponent is just, they've stabilized around six life and you're just hoping, oh, I just, I need to draw two burn spells. Well, with Fire Confluence, you only need to draw one burn spell, just Fire Confluence. Being able to do six damage right to their face for only four mana, which is perfectly castable as like the top end of a red deck that has 15 lands or so, it's great. Uh, take it, I don't know if it's better than Koth, but I do know that it goes much later than Koth for what de for the red decks. So so take it. Even you know sometimes it's even just good for the the red control type decks. You know being able to do a pyroclasm and blow up a mana artifact is fine as well. But the red decks, especially the red deck wins type decks, you really want this card. So coming in at number two are are a set of very similar effects. There's three cards here, and that is Strip Mine, Reshadon Port, and Wasteland. And the, all three of them, I think, go much later than they should. I think Port and Wasteland go, Reshadon Port and Wasteland go a little bit later than Strip Mine. I think people in general recognize that Strip Mine is powerful, but nevertheless, Strip Mine often will go, I often see it like fourth pick or fifth pick. And all of these effects basically are just, they're just colorless lands that tax your opponent's mana. And when you're playing a mono white deck or a mono red deck, I think, again, like like Caracas before, they're, they're cards that go in your deck that don't take up a slot, and they're so, so important. You know, especially Strip Mine, uh, when you're playing mono white or you're playing mono red, because often you, you'll open up a hand, and you'll see, well, you'll have four, say you'll have four red spells, you'll have two mountains, and you'll have a Strip Mine. Well, you know in your, in, you know, with your knowledge that whatever land they can, they're gonna play first, you're just gonna strip mine it. And you're just gonna start the game over again. And they don't know that. And they, and nobody plans on it. So, you know, people will very often, this happens all the time, they'll keep a hand that has two lands and a signet. They have three mana sources in their hand and they think that they're set. So they play a land and you strip mine them. And the fact that you've had that asymmetric information and they weren't able to plan for that, will often just win you the game because they're going to stumble. They might, you know, they might miss a land drop. They certainly might miss a, a, a spell drop. You know, they might then be, their, their curve has been set back one and uh, it's, it's just very, very strong. Especially, you know, even on turn two, like if you're on the play and you can do like a, a Jackal Pup and then the next turn you do Strip Mine. They're, again, they're just so far behind. They're just trying to catch up while you're hitting them again and again and again. Reaching on port. Uh, it's not quite as good as Strip Mine, but I think it's the second best effect because you get to, uh, if they have just a single basic land of a single color, you get to just take it out, you know, um, out of their ability to cast cards of that color. Uh, and which, which Wasteland, I think is the worst of these effects, does not have. There are a lot of duels in the format, but sometimes Wasteland ends up being a blank. You know, if your opponent is playing a, a monocolor deck and they go forest, forest, and you you kept your hand because you you had wasteland, uh, and um, you were thought, oh, I'm gonna make them stumble with wasteland and they don't play any non-basics, and you can't do that, they will often set you back a little bit, or at the very least, like your 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 hand won't play out the the way that you had planned for it to to play out. But nevertheless, I think if I'm playing a mono red deck, I'm still gonna take wasteland because, you know, if you're playing. Usually you might have two colorless lands, so you might have 13 mountains, that's still gonna be fine. Wasteland is still gonna be great. Strip Mine, Reshadon Port, and Wasteland. If you're an aggressive white or red deck, I think these are cards you wanna take very highly, or at least such a lot higher than, than they go. And coming in at number one, these are cards that all of them, every one of them I see, I have seen on the wheel countless times. I've seen them go 13th pick, 14th pick, 15th pick. And I really think that's wrong, unless there's just nobody in the decks for them. And these are all creatures that blow up artifacts or enchantments, or stop them from being used. So there's there's a bunch of them in, in different colors. Uh, in white, you have like Lean and Relic Order. In red, you have Manic Vandal. In green, you have Reclamation Sage. And then like a colorless one, you have Phyrexian Revoker. And all, th all four of these are great because they, again, just like the, the lands before, they cause your opponents to stumble on mana. 
while also providing pressure. And I think for the aggressive decks, that is often how you win. If you can just make their combo win, take one more turn, that's all you need to win the game. You just need to do that one extra turn. In, 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 in Legacy, if you play Mono Red Burn, it's so consistent. You're gonna be killing them on turn four pretty much every single time. Sometimes turn three, sometimes turn five, but they're, if, if they haven't won the game by turn four, then they're dead. In, in the Vintage Cube, the decks are not quite as consistent, especially the white deck, but you know, even the red deck is not quite as consistent. Sometimes it takes turn five or turn six or turn seven just to push that last bit of damage through. So if you can come down and you can steal a Signet or blow up a Signet or a Revoker a Signet, often that's gonna be all that you need to just giving you that little bit of extra advantage to take them off curve and win the game. Uh, Revoker is one that I'm always surprised to see go really late. I really like it because again, it can shut off a, a Signet, whereas a Pivy Needle can't. I don't, I don't like Pythene Needle in the cube at all because it doesn't answer the, the artifact mana, but this one does. It ad answers the artifact, but still will also like being able to shut down a Planeswalker or a creature that's just kind of hard to deal with that has an activated ability. So all, all four of these, I think if you're playing in those colors and you're like, if you're aggressive white deck, you want Lean and Rolling Quarter. If you're an aggressive red deck, you want Manic Vandal. If you're a green deck of any sort, you want Reclamation Sage. And if you're aggressive white or red deck, you want Phyrexian Revoker, I think, in your deck. All four of those are cards that go much, much later than they should, but they win because they make your opponent stumble, they kept an opening hand with a game plan, and you threw them off their game plan. So there we go, another top 10 list. Like I said at the beginning of the video, I have done essentially no preparation for any of these. I don't know what I'm talking about, but, uh, Maria keeps landing me in her house to do it. She's a sucker and she keeps putting me in front of this camera. And while she's doing that, I'm gonna to continue to take advantage of it. So thank you all for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Have a good one.